Con Fusion 2016. Who well, took my monster? It uh, is nine o'clock on a Friday night, and you still came. <laughs> so, good for you. You know, good for you. We could all be doing something else now, but yes. John, so you want your credit card back? <laughs> Why don't you just read in the number right now? <laughs> Exploration. All right. If, does anyone else have any potential credit card fraud? Like <laughs> Begin. All right. Let's let's start this. Uh, Council, I apologize for being late. I'm very sorry. Don't hurt me. <laughs> no, this is fine. Um, who threw away my monster companion? Hey. Is the name of this? Uh, good. Good. We got, we got comedians here. Uh, when was the last time a zeitgeist novel had a bugbear or a cockatrice? How long is it since someone fought a giant flesh-eating beast instead of pikemen? Where did all the monsters go? With quest plots out of fashion, deus ex machina ditched, treasure hunting too economically dull, and stories about ethics, is the monster still relevant in today's fiction? Davey, you're an editor. Please answer that question, yes or no. No. Here we go. Done. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to talk about this uh, because it has been on my mind for a while. We just we don't seem to write about monsters anymore, fellas. It's all about politics and incest and other exciting topics. You can't have incest with a bear. <laughs> you can, and that gets you a bug bear. <laughs> But how, come Albert. You, how come you don't do that? <laughs> so first of all, I would like us to go down the line here, introduce ourselves. I am Sam Sykes, author of The City Stained Red and An Affinity for Steel. I wear a nice hat. Um, I've been smelling all sorts of strange things today. Uh, and I, I think monsters are pretty cool. How about, how about you, Marco Klus, uh, author of Chain of Commands? Marco, that was good. Yes, Marco Klus. Uh, I have this little series on it's called the Fortnite series, which is military sci fi. Um, uh, two. God, how many books am I up to now? Four? Five? Five. five. Oh, I'm really writing on the fifth. The fourth one will be out in April. This, this is it, by the way. Behold. Wow. Yes, I know, right? Cool. And, and I, I get paid to make up stuff. Just, just All right. How about you, Davey? Uh, I'm Davey Pillay. I'm the editorial director for Orbit and Red Hook. I get paid to read, or so people tell me. And there's way too many people in this audience that are here to heckle me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I know who you are. Megan O'Keefe. I am Megan O'Keefe. Sam thinks it's hilarious to call me Megan O'Keefe. He is one of the first people I ever met at a convention, and I'm sure you're all wondering why I'm still here. <laughs> I uh, just debuted my first novel, Steal the Sky. It came out January 5th with Anger Robot. Um, after this, if you want a free copy, we're giving them away at the Anger Robot party. So, free books. Uh, my name is John Warner Jacobs. I'm filling in for Doug Hewlett. He's much taller than me and even better looking. He's a nice guy. He is He's nice. Scary. We are all sad by his loss. Yeah. By our loss. And the reason I'm here is uh, I've written a bunch of books in a various amounts of genres for young adult and fantasy. All right, John, uh, since we're down at your end, do uh, you write monsters? Do you like monsters? You know, you're a monster kind of guy? So there's, uh, I, I was thinking about this just in the seconds that you told me what the panel was about. Right. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in horror, you do write about monsters. Right. But there is a big push towards going towards the human monster. I mean, like, like you know, it's often like, you know, there might be fantastical creatures, but it's always sort of human element that becomes right. monstrous. Um, and you know, I think there is some real space for, uh, you know, this the element of uh, a, a natural antagonist. Like you know, you look at the the revenant. You know, mm -hmm. there's that bear sex scene. Is he actually sodomized by a bear? Totally. That's nailed. like that's like the actual story. No, I haven't seen that's it. Yet. Not but that. No, I haven't seen it either. I'm just making sure. What? <laughs> Was he? No. You know, with the bear? No. no, he just mauled by. Mauled by. Mauled or like you know, 
mold. No, this is like the, oh, okay. bad hurt type of mold. The bad kind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, well, that's that's a pretty good uh, question you got there. Like, can you do monsters that sort of natural antagonism? Do they need to be humanized for them to be workable? Because I think the real reason of we don't do too many monsters is because it's hard to present a monster's point of view and have that be interesting. Like, one of the big reasons that Game of Thrones got so interesting is because you got to see everyone's agenda, everyone's motive. If you do that with a monster, you're not going to see much. He's pretty much interested in uh, eating and possibly sodomy. Well, I don't think they have to be humanized, but they have to have some sort of reasoning and intellect. Like, if you take one of the best monster movies, which is Jaws, mm. And he's like, he's a fish. He's a big, smart fish. You know, you know, like in, in, in what accent was that? I don't know. Fuck out. <laughs> but um, but the fish sort of outsmarts them. You know, it has to have some sort of reasoning belief so that it is a little bit humanized, but it's just intelligence in my opinion. Okay, Megan, uh, please add to that. I don't think they necessarily have to be intelligent. I, I agree that that's a good thing. But I think uh, forces of nature can just be scary. Like it, they don't have to have reasoning capability. They just have to have their drives to follow their. Uh, at that point, uh, it sort of becomes because a, a a point where the monster monsters are basically stories of survival, aren't they? Trying to get away from the monster, and you know Jaws is still about the people. It basically makes the protagonist do double duty. Yeah. Because they it have makes to, them work harder is always good. Yeah, which is always great. But I can see why that why a lot of people might think that might not add as much to the story as a, a human antagonist with a different uh, <laughs> different take on it. Uh Davy, what, what are your what are your what are your thoughts on this? I have very few. So few. Well, I mean <laughs> you're on here, dude, so <laughs> uh, actually I wanna get I wanna I want to get your opinion on something after, but Marco, did you have anything, do you think you can still do monsters and still have it be, yes. get the emotional investment? Yeah, but, but it's like, we, we've kind of shuffled monsters off, like the classic monsters that everybody grew up with, like, you know, vampires, werewolves, they have their, like, section of the bookstore now where there's like, the, the, the girl with the tattoos and the sword and right? <laughs> Yeah. It's all, it's a very, like, if you write, like for example, like one of my favorite like classical monsters is like the the werewolves, you know, the shapeshifters. But it's been so overdone that if you put a werewolf in the story, it better be a fucking original werewolf because like people have read this stuff. And, and because you were just saying like, can it be done? And has it has it been done really effectively? Like how do you show the monster's point of view? And I can't remember the name of the author, but it's the guy who did uh, you know the Beowulf monster Grendel from Grendel. Grendel's point of view? John um, Gardner. Yes, thank you. And that was you know it, it was so well done and it's so rarely done to to get to the monster's head and then actually have to. And the other thing that I was thinking of was um, uh, Peter Watts' short story that's done from the perspective of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and when that is done, and somebody does it. Somebody actually takes that ball and runs with it and we can. It, it's so rarely done well that when it is done well, it just blows your mind because you know it's just this whole different perspective. It's no longer like this force of nature, and it's also not like this this angsty. You know, the monster is inside of us. You know, like the humans are the worst monsters. No, it's still a fucking terrifying monster, but it's like, and you get into its head, and it's not thinking like a person. And and when it's well done, you can pull it off, and then it's just mind blowing. Mm. Well done. Thank thank you for actually putting in. That. <laughs> um, well, Davey, you're in a kind of you're in a unique position on this panel because you actually uh, buy books what? and you are a discerning reader. So, what was the what was the last book that you read that had a monster in it that you were like, yes, yes to this? I love it. Lila Vaughn, like Vultures. Besides that. Oh shit. <laughs> what? Uh, well, what did, what did you like about? How'd that work out? I think it worked out really well. Okay, so what about it work? I think that it, it involves the monsters. What Lila did was take a premise, which was basically the West, and she took monsters, mm. and she did it in a very different, unique way. Basically, Nettie is a little half Indian, half black girl, mm -hmm. and she is basically a slave to her foster parents, and one day she walks, wakes up, 
a man is attacking her, she can't do anything about it. Like nothing she does stops him until like not even a pitchfork getting through his eye. But she takes a stick and she stabs him and he falls apart into dust. Mm. And now because of that one moment, she can see all the monsters, like all the supernatural. Okay. And I think there was a really cool line where she says, now she knows why there's so much sand in the desert. You know? Oh. But there's a really, really cool look at the monsters and about Nettie herself, who's a great protagonist. Mm. Great review in IO9, you guys should check it out. But it's a very, very different way of doing something like that. So it's you, set kind of in the West. So like different is key. Like different is key. We can't regurgitate the same monsters. I think it's less about anybody can regurgitate. It depends on how you do it. Not everyone. Well you and not everyone can do it well. Exactly. Last night after that much scotch. No one was regurgitating well. Really? Yeah. Okay, but anyways, that, you didn't come here to hear that. Man is a real monster, is the lesson there. You might be a real yeah. monster. So, but I think, I think there's always a potential. Like, the second that I say I'm never going to buy X, yeah. is the second I'm going to buy it. Right. Obviously. So, for, for those aspiring writers we have here, uh, who might have monsters, what would you say makes a monster uh, a hard sell? Stupid what? Just a stupid monster. Just a stupid monster. Like, like, have you seen, like, there's some where they're just mindless, like, eating machines, or, like, there's just no fun to it. Or they're... That's, that's kind of why I really miss monsters, is because, you know, I, I love courtly intrigue as much as anyone else. It doesn't have to be courtly. Well, yeah, but, I mean, we, we sort of lost that element of fun in fantasy, I think, and monsters were key to that. And we sort of almost ruined magic by... You know, throwing down magic systems every which way, throwing down world building a lot, sort of made stuff that is designed to break the rules, giving them more rules. So it feels like monsters taking that away has sort of ruined the fun about it. So would you say that it's fair to say monsters sort of reintroduce that fun? Or better, yet, like if they come out, they have to be pretty fun. I don't know. I don't know. Cool. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Depends on how it's done. I mean, like seriously, like if you could give me a specific example of where you think a monster was fun. Tell what, me. Is, what is your? Uh, yeah, I actually meant to ask this, but I got carried away. Uh, what was the last book that panelists have read that had monsters in it that you really liked? And I will say that uh, one of this wasn't the last book, but it stands out in my mind very clearly. Uh, the Warded Man by Peter Brett has really cool monsters, and they're these uh, demons that rise out of the earth, and whatever they pass through, they, they take on that element, so there's like fire demons and wood demons, and it's all really cool. Uh, and I thought he did some very excellent monsters, because they wove into the world building pretty nicely. Like, it was basically post-apocalypse, because there are demons at night all the time, no one can get anything done. But that was my favorite. Uh, Marco, what was the last thing you read then? Had monsters uh, only but goody, I downloaded because I came across it at Amazon. I downloaded the the graphic novel, the the, the omnibus of the uh, the uh, the old Dark Horse Aliens. You know the the graphic novels that they did in the universe, and, and it's all done by these different artists, and it's volume after volume, and you have, it's interesting to see all these different artist styles tackling that one monster, and you know they are monsters, and and they're a good example of why. A monster. We don't necessarily have to get into the monster's head, and we don't has to necessarily have to, like, when you do like a werewolf story, it's almost tropey that the, you know, the werewolf is like the, the well, duality of man mm -hmm. and being torn between your animalistic half and blah blah blah, and then and trying to control the beast. Whatever. Aliens are just like we don't understand. We, we understand them functionally because biologically we're the same. You know, they're driven to survival. We're driven to survival. They're just way more efficient at it than, than we are. But they're like they're terrifying because. You know, there, there's no you re remove this whole element of inhibition, like you do with, with a werewolf, but then you also remove this whole duality. They have one function; they're like living machines, and they're really good at it. And and I was just when I was reading the whole that whole compendium, I was just like, you know, that's an effective monster because they're scary as hell, and we don't need to understand them. We just need to understand that they are good at what they do, and that you can't reason with them. And 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 you know, if if like like Ripley, you know, one of them gets to earth, you know, you can just kiss all this shit goodbye, and, and there's no, like, philosophical wrangling, on like, all the philosophical wrangling they do in the series is, like, like how, uh, what bastards humans are, even in the face of the extinction, they, they still backstab each other, like Ripley, 
when she when she pins Burke against the wall here's ago. You know, at least they don't fuck each other over for a percentage. But uh, yeah, that's that those are that's the last thing I read that had monsters in it was like, yeah, that's how it's done. Okay. Davey, are you still going with Wake of Vultures? That's what I'm going with. No, you're you're gonna double down. I'm doubling down. Alright. Uh mm -hmm. Megan, what 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 what, what say you? Um, the last thing I read that actually the monsters managed to creep me out, um, and similar to Mark in that they were aliens, is uh, Peter Watson's Blind Sight. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. Yeah. Sweet. Yes. It was, yeah. Talk about the force of nature situation. That was incredibly creepy. Um, and without giving too many spoilers, the uh, aliens are essentially have, have, are a branch of evolution that has decided sentience is a dead end. So they are essentially biological machines, and they are just doing their thing for survival. And there's really not much you can do to stop them. Hmm. They are far more advanced than you are. Very oh. scary. Uh, so I've long held sort of the theory, like everyone always uh, runs out the there are new no, there are no new stories, you know. Sure. Uh, and I'm I'm always like, well, you know, what makes a new story is usually a character, and only you know as an author you can bring that out. Right. So, I mean, you could say the same about monsters. Um, it's it's really just sort of up into the in the individual author's skill, tone, style to make it new. And the um, one book that really sort of stands out that takes traditional monsters and, and they're still just traditional monsters is Glenn Duncan's The Last Werewolf, uh, which is just a flawless, brilliant piece of writing, uh, at least in my opinion. And, um, it's, it's almost literary in the sense that his style is so unique and the, the narrator's voice, who is a werewolf, is, is so compelling and so unique that, um, that it makes it all new again, hmm. you know. And, and it, but it's same rules, same, you know, everything. It's not like he's reinventing the werewolf. He's just doing it in such a unique and individual way that it becomes new again. And looking at things like in the way his protagonist only his right. So we get we have an interesting duality there, in that we have uh, forces, basically force of nature creatures that are just unfathomable, can't be reasoned with, can barely be understood. But we've got that very human element that you said, and I'd like to get back to that. But there's a question that's been burning on, that's been weighing on my mind for a while: vampires, werewolves, very ancient. Legends, monster legends, now mostly boyfriends. <laughs> what will the next monster to be sexy be? <laughs> like, let's get ahead. Let's get ahead of this trend right now, ghouls, and ghouls. find out. Yeah, we don't have a sexy ghoul story. We don't have a sexy ghoul story yet. Golems. Golems. That's like that's that's just like a real Frank problem, isn't it? I don't know why they're not making possessed sex doll. Movies, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like the, they're already fucking creepy, right? I mean, why haven't they? Because there's always the possessed puppet yeah. movie or whatever. Why is someone not like this sex, this silicon sex doll? Yeah, they look very surprised, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, Sam, I wouldn't know. But, uh, like, they look very surprised. <laughs> well, what would they uh, do when they attack? That would be the interesting thing. How do they attack? <laughs> <laughs> do they just try to strangle you, or do they have like yeah. sex themed? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That would, pitch me. Know. Pitch me. Let me, let me think on that a little bit. I think it's been done once. Who did it? I think Matt Ruff did it, and, and he wrote this the first novel. He did Fool on the Hill. It's the late '80s. I love that novel. Okay. Uh, when I was th that age, it's, it's, it's aged pretty pretty well. But it's like this really. I don't know if anybody's read it. It's this really. And he wrote it when he was at Cornell in his early 20s. And the writing style is, you know, a little rough, like it sometimes expected. But he was really, really talented, even at that age. And the, the whole thing is just like, you know, you have a cat and a dog searching for heaven. Uh, you have the writer in residence who, you know, falls in love with the most beautiful woman in the world. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of the, like Greek myth and whatever. But it's, it's really well written. And one of the antagonists is this mannequin, this sex doll that is basically imbued with life by the you know the evil uh, spirit that's like the main antagonist of the story and it goes like on this this killing rampage and so it's been done once at least okay. and it wasn't done badly 
Okay. So, right, like, what what, is, the what is the next sexy monster? I'm saying mummies still. Mummies, huh? Yeah. You got that, you got that little silken wrap thing going, going on. on there? Yeah. yeah, it's an apple. There you go, they're exotic. They are. But they have no organs. The testicles no. are removed. <laughs> <laughs> they're all in canopic jars. So maybe that story is like the quest for like, your mummy boyfriend's They, 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 they yeah. love you with their car. <laughs> with their car. Wow. That's what You're on fire tonight, dude. <laughs> you got like sexy murderous sex dolls and like sexy mummies. Got I... take like I want the rest of this panel. It's not going to be, but really I just want to like bust out a monster manual and like just choose a random monster and ask you to make a sexy story about it. <laughs> uh, let's do let's it. Just, let's just, yeah, let's just try that. I actually monster. have a monster manual. No, oh, do you? Uh, oh. I always I to, travel with one. I, I used to carry one around. <laughs> <laughs> the RV picture, as we mentioned earlier. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, don't make me. A oh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's 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 go with that. Uh, give me give me a sexy harpy story. Elevate the pitch. Davy's watching. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think they're t technically called Irenes, is what they are, and they're um, yeah they're wrathful spirits. Oh. So, um, are they, or did the harpy come around because, like, some <coughs> Greek guy are saw you a bird? My bitch, or he saw a bird and said, you're I don't fuck that. <laughs> That's probably it. Yeah, you're right. All right, well, okay. Bust, bust out your book. Okay, so, uh, a Lothario. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, he messes up. And then in ancient Greece, and all these harpies are going to fuck him to death. <laughs> That's, that's the and they chase him guys, through yeah. the countryside, and he's oh. wearing a loincloth. Okay. He's oily. <laughs> Is he naturally Glistening in the sun. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He's, he's running, and you know the natural juices start <laughs> exuding everywhere. Listening. Oh, tap now. Tap now. <laughs> oh, this is awful because I'm like writing the first book paragraph of this of this particular slash week in life. When Dr. Johnson, the ornithologist, set out for his field trip, he thought it was just like any other day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> Meg, Meg, can you top that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Marco, you seem up to the challenge. If I if I bust out a monster manual monster right now, can you give me a sexy story about it? Uh, well, give it a try. All right, cockatrice. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you a low ball. Uh, what is it? A cockatrice. I, I, I can't picture that. Thing it's a, it's the Demon fucking chicken. it's the chicken, Demon and chicken. he's got bat wings, yeah. and he pecks you and, and you turn to stone. Oh, and I just the waste, jokes write themselves. Yeah, and, I, and I just wasted the thing with the ornithologist. Yeah, the, man. The army, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. How come it's always birds? <laughs> well, there's a gelatinous cube. Yeah. Gelatinous cube. Tell us about a sexy gelatinous oh, oh, cube. Oh, sexy gelatinous cube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm thinking like Jello, so I'm like, okay. This is probably why there are no monsters in modern fantasy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's too sexy. Yeah. <laughs> it's too sexy. America's prudish sensibilities are not ready for sexy cockatrices and Maybe sexy the real monster. Cute. Maybe indeed society is the real monster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, friends. Uh, you really think there's no cockatrice slash bit out there like cockatrice porn? Like, like you Google that right now. There's like, like no all right, you know, I know we started with a challenge, but all right, <coughs> David, do you can can you talk that? Would you buy a a book about sexy cockatrice? Totally. Yeah. Done. Just any bird. Just write it. It's 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 there. All right. So there is a great book about a cockatrice. What is it called? It's Sorry. called the Book of the Dun Cow. Oh, yeah. And it's about a chicken, Chanticlay, okay. who has to fight in an epic, it's about farmyard animals, and it's an epic fantasy in which he has to fight a cockatrice. It's a great book. I'll have to have him to write this down. Yeah. What? I'll write this down. The Book of the Dun Cow. It, it is sort of a religious allegory, but that's okay. Okay. So, in to, to try to weave these back together, in the tale of the murder sex dolls, do you try to present them as unstoppable forces of nature, or do you try to humanize them? Because like, there are... if you were a, if you were a thing, if you were a crazy sex doll, and you just had to, 
and you just had, well, you, right, you know what I mean. I'm not suggesting sex dolls are a naturally occurring phenomenon. <laughs> a, 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 a naturally replenishing resource. I don't believe some man in Sweden goes out to harvest the sex dolls. Oh, the sex dolls. <laughs> <laughs> the sex dolls. Not, that would not be the tree of woe, that would be the tree, the tree of... Uh, so many, so tree many potential book titles. <laughs> Uh, harvesting the sex dolls. But my own like, <laughs> I feel like this panel has gotten just a little bit off the off a particular track and off of this like. Well, no, we're we're weaving it back in. Uh, <laughs> sort sort of. But like you're a. I think he's touting your ability to moderate. The, the yeah. like, Remember what I said when the panel started? Like, why don't I ever get invited to those sex panels? And I, I take back what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but like you're a sex doll. You're being sexed up day in, day out. You come back. Like, do we sympathize with the sex doll, or...? Well, yeah. Wind up, girl. Oh. oh. I see what you yeah, did. She's so sweaty. we already did this. Jesus Christ. Yeah, there are no new done. stories. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a microphone, I would just give you the horrible sound she would make when she was coming to kill you. And coming was spelled C-O-M-I-N-G. Um, which was... Which was That's what you'd hear beforehand. You know, just be like her nasty feet. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary, isn't it? Yeah, all right. Um, but yeah, we did. We did. You lost your erection, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Marco. This is being recorded. <laughs> Being recorded. It wasn't like we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh right. Hey, we all, we all agreed you two, to it. We're sorry. <laughs> Talk about sex doll. <laughs> like zoom in on me right now. <laughs> like right on this eye. Watch the light fade from it. <laughs> Alright, but we did, we did get off track because. <laughs> Marco's time is Dragons. Actually, that's a good point. Dragons, a lot dragons. Of we, we still keep on dragons. Yeah. So, do you think it's, it's sort of a rule of cool thing, isn't it? Like, you can only have really cool shit now. You can't just have random monsters with no particular, with no particular impetus. Actually, here's, here's a better question because that was complete garbage. You. Do you think monsters only can sort of only work in the purview of world building? Because, you know, zombie stories. Zombies aren't necessarily the interesting part. They're window dressing to force other people into conflict. Zombies are bad weather. Yeah, zombies are bad weather. It's like, what, how, what are we going to do about these dang zombies? Nothing. So do you think that's where we find most effective monsters these days. Cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm just letting someone else. Yeah, do you, do you have anything to add to that, Mark? Like, obviously we've covered different ways in which it could work, but do you think that might be a more effective way these days than perhaps presenting? What, mo the mo monsters as, as, as world weather. building? As world building, as weather. As, or do you think that might rob them of some of their well, any, everything you do, like even the monster stories, like the most boring stuff, like I, I was never scared by like this Friday the 13th because it's like senseless. Like, you know, the monster that just like, hacks and slashes away without any motivation. And he's not even like a natural disaster, but this this latest, yeah, and yeah it's a, it is a recent trend, like the zombie movies, but I'm also thinking like, uh, oh, Pacific Rim, you know, the kaiju being this force of yeah. nature. And that, what is this? And I had an idea for a short story and I was just playing with it. and. But, but what is a kaiju other than an, than a, it's like a hurricane or like yeah. a storm, it you just know, shows it hits the coastal shit. cities, wrecks the city, and then moves off, and then, um, but in, in whatever monster you think of, I mean, you, you've got the, the philosophically interesting stuff, with it, but, but it's all forces, the, they're, they're a tool to, you know, for us to, to force people into conflict with each other, and like, like, it's it's there's no it's, it's not interesting if it's just a monster 
and it's just like a, this force of nature stuff. Do jump in though. I mean, it's you know the the man versus nature is a you know it's a crucible in which you place your characters, and there's a lot of great drama that can occur with that. But if we're talking about real monsters, it's like you know you, you start falling back on these ones that you always know if they're antagonists, and so you know we're a culture that has gotten to the point and the, the inertia where we're always reevaluating our culture. So we're going back and looking at, we remix music, we relook at um, all literature, we're remixing.